Now, I talk about fake equity all the time. <laughs> all the time. People go, oh, here she goes again. She's talking about fake equity and leadership. And that, for me, is when you say the right things, but you don't follow through. You don't take the action. And we have to have a line in New Zealand's health system which says we are not going to stand for leadership that is fake equity anymore. E te waitu, e te waitā, nau mai haramai ki tēnei ko nai ipurangi ko ao mai te rā. Welcome back to Ao Mai Te Rā, our podcast where we talk about how to get rid of racism. Uh, we have a, a very special guest today, uh, Sharon Share. Welcome. Uh, Sharon is a mokapuna of Ngāti Ranginui, Ngāti Haua, Ngāti Hine, Ngāti Hako, and is well known to many of us in the health field. She's got a legal background. She's worked in the National Health Service in the UK. She's top of her class from Oxford in comparative social policy and is the co-chair of the Māori Health Authority currently and is on the board of Health New Zealand. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for being with us today. So we're here to talk about racism. I wonder if we could start with you sharing some of your own personal experiences of racism. Yeah, tēnā koutou katoa ngā mihi nui, ngā mihi aroha ki a koutou. Look, um, first of all, um, Hene Moa, thank you so much for the opportunity to kore do today. I'm, I feel very honoured. Um, and as I was saying to you, I'm a bit of a fan uh, and um, have your puka puka in our whare and have found that to be really valuable in terms of uplifting our Modi and using whakatauki to support that. So ngā mihi nui ki a, ki a koe. Kia Personal experience as well. How long have we got as a person who's worked for her professional career supporting Māori, de, Māori development? Um, I've come across a lot of uh, racism, bias and discrimination as well. And also just personally, you know, out and about in the community and things like that. So I remember many times I've been um, yelled at, I've been made to feel um, small, had those email warriors sending emails about uh, attacking the, the co-papa, attacking me personally. I've been followed around in terms of open homes just to make sure that we don't um, um, tahai anything, you know, silly stuff like that. Where I live, assumptions being made that we uh, can't afford to live in the area, actually. So, yes, it is, it is prolific, but um, on the other hand, some things are changing, which is a good thing as well. Mm. Mm. And, and in your roles, in your leadership roles at the moment, I mean, you're, you're at this structural level, this, this revolution in, in our health reforms in Aotearoa, New Zealand at the moment. How do you draw on perhaps the personal experiences and your own experiences of those structures to inform ways in which we can get the most out of those reforms, uh, particularly for our own as Māori. Yeah, look, um, part of the part of the mahi that we're doing in the Māori Health Authority uh, with Health New Zealand, I talk to people. It's like we're the personification of the partnership. You know, you've got Health New Zealand as the Tangata Tiriti side, and Māori Health Authority as the Tangata Whenua side. And people say to me, well, how, how are you going to make that work? Because we often talk about the fact that the, the te tiriti or waitangi has not been fulfilled. And there is so much promise in fulfilling te tiriti. And part of our role is to practically demonstrate that and to practically show that not only is fulfilling the promise of te tiriti an opportunity for Māori in terms of um, equity and um, rangatiratanga and other important things, but also to demonstrate the fact that, you know, what, what works for Māori works for all. And there's so many fantastic service examples of what that looks like. And the first one that pops to mind is Fano Ora and how Fano Ora has really stood up and vaccinated many people from many ethnicities, including, of course, our valued own people, and how we've heard many stories about the type of manaki that people have received as part of whānau water vaccination services and health services. So that's part of the opportunity is to fulfil the promise of Te Tiriti 
by living the partnership between Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority. Um, so we're looking at the nature of our relationship in many ways. So if I think about it at a system level, you've got to remember that we're working within a system as a system. And so um, one of the important things about combating systemic racism is to think about how we might have a role, a place, a function, and a true partnership across the whole system. So our strategy is to influence the whole system for the benefit of Māori and for the benefit of all. And we have set up some structures in place to make that a reality. Mm. Yeah, and and I suppose that that kind of um, the aspiration to really manifest and make real that that Tetiriti partnership is is a compelling argument, and and it's something we've we've it's not new we've heard about it before. I suppose one of the one of the challenges in the COVID context, and that, and actually that's one of the reasons we're meeting via Zoom today. We'd much prefer to meet Kanohiki to Kanohiki, but of course we're in this Omicron wave. Um, is the pressure on Māori providers to do more and more with really less of the resource, but to find a way to get more hours in the day to to keep people working when they're when they're cl- close to burnout. And so, I, w- I wonder what what thoughts you've already had about you know in the thick of this COVID pandemic, the stresses and strains that are actually continue to, to heap on our Māori providers as a form of further inequity because, of course, the, the problem is we expect ourselves to keep going and going and going for, for our own, but actually we're subsidising uh, the, the rest of the system by doing so. Mm. I think look, it's, not a, um, it's not an easy answer, mm. but um, I, think we, I think we need to think a bit more laterally as well um, sometimes in health, we're a little bit insular in our thinking and how we might be able to solve a problem. But <clears throat> the first thing is the Māori Health Authority is set up to support and value to manaki to grow and scale Māori providers and Māori services across Aotearoa New Zealand. One of the beautiful things about having a Māori Health Authority is that it is a given that Māori organisations that deliver services to our people are valued. Mm-hmm. That's a given. No longer do they need to fight that battle where they are having to constantly go to um, a funder in the health sector and say, actually, hello, we've got the answer. We know what we're doing. We have expertise. You should value us. You should value us, our mātauranga Māori, our te ao Māori solutions. They don't, that, that, that hurdle is gone. So I don't think we can underestimate the impact the positive impact that we'll have moving forward. We've also made it really clear to our partners, Health New Zealand, who, by the way, we've um, worked hard to build a a strong relationship with from the get-go. So from board to board, we have um, excellent relationships with the Health New Zealand board and in particular the chair, Rob Campbell. Um, Also, we have uh, recently appointed, as you'll know, two women of culture, two wahine of culture, to actually lead the Aotearoa New Zealand health system. So that's Margie Upper for Health New Zealand and Rian Emanuel for the Māori Health Authority. So that's a signal as well, Ihoa, in terms of where we're going and how important it is to imbue a transformed health system with culture and in particular te ao Māori, mātauranga Māori thinking from um, a Māori perspective. So we're trying to create those platforms, those levers for change at multiple different levels, because when they all kick in, for once, we will be moving from cumulative disadvantage to cumulative advantage. So that's a really important thing for us all to get behind to support. So going back to the Māori um, providers and Māori services, one of our strategies as the Māori Health Authority is to double double down um, on uh, Te Ao Māori solutions. So we just recently made an announcement about Aputia. It's small at this moment, um, and it's just for this financial year. But, for example, we will be um, um, investing uh, uh, $2 million into Ruhoa, 
rongo services across the motu, which is actually a doubling of the investment from health. And we will continue to grow those services because they are a practical expression of the beauty and the wisdom of our culture. And it's only um, right that our whānau have legitimate options and choices in terms of what health services look like. So we're doing work in that space. We've got an expanded Māori provider development um, approach going on. We, um, as I said, value te ao Māori, Mātaranga Māori solutions. So we are going to invest more money in that space. So not just in Rongoa, that's one example. Um, but thinking about Mātaranga inspired health literacy, wahine, wānanga, thinking about building our whānau Māori, our whānau wairua. Those are all innate solutions that deserve their rightful place in terms of New Zealand's health system. But that's only part of our work. Yeah, we've got a lot more going on as well. Yeah, and, and it's really it's really inspiring and exciting to hear um, all of those in initiatives and, and that um, way of thinking, which is a kind of coming home to ourselves in a way, is what yeah. I take from that. And a and, and recognition that we, we have the solutions to our own issues and challenges. A hundred percent. Yeah. So how do you see the, the potential barriers of racism? We've got excellent research, which unfortunately shows that that is rampant across all of, um, all of healthcare services and healthcare structures, as well as the interfaces with other um, entities such as um, youth justice, such as care and protection, such as education. What are some of the thoughts that you have about how you're directly going to address that or, or solutions that you've already come to around helping people, I suppose, even notice racism? Because mm -hmm. we, we know that this is not theoretical. And I think some people do struggle with the idea of well, what does racism even mean? So I'm keen to hear your um, your wise counsel about that. Yeah, look, our, our thinking is, is still emerging in this space. Actually, we haven't even got a front door yet. We're, we're still what they call a Section 11 committee. So um, we open our, our literal front door on the 1st of July. But having said that, this is top of mind for us. Um, and some of the things that I've already talked about are actually strategies which will counteract racism because they are about showcasing success. One of the things that myself and our board do want to showcase more is what's working as well as what's not working and to bring a balance to our corridor. We do have a lot of our whānau who are healthy and who are wonderful, aspirational people. So why shouldn't we be celebrating that and building on their strengths and enabling people to combine their strengths to thrive? rather just engaging with people when things aren't working. So there's something about that balance, which we need to get right as part of our overarching commissioning. But sorry, if I go back to um, solutions around racism. So one of the things, several things, but one of the things we've been talking about and I talk about often to colleagues is before you can actually change, you actually have, you have to understand and you have to commit so there's got to be an uh, enhanced program or programmatic work around um, enabling people to really understand and commit. And then post that, there will be some work associated with, well, what is the realisation of that commitment and understanding? So there's a couple of things that we can do off the bat, which is um, understanding and turning around unwarranted clinical variation, for example. You know, when, and let's just talk about access and decisions made by people consciously or unconsciously when they get in, when our people are in front of them and they, they make decisions which actually impede access for issues that actually have got nothing to do with clinical issues, everything to do with bias, discrimination or racism. So we need to turn that around. Um, but there's other things, uh, and I like to talk about leadership. So I talk about fake equity all the time. All the time, people go, oh, here she goes again. She's talking about fake equity and leadership. And that, for me, is when you say the right things, but you don't follow through. You don't take the action. And we have to have a line in New Zealand's health system which says we are not going to stand for leadership that is fake equity anymore. So we've had really good conversations with our Health New Zealand colleagues 
very good conversations with both CEOs of Māori Health Authority and Health New Zealand saying that leadership is key and we're not going to stand for fake equity. And we're in the process of um, setting up both organisations from the CE to the Tier 2. And one of our characteristics, one of our um, non-negotiables for the leadership of this health system is they have to be the antithesis of fake equity. And leadership is key. Kia ora for that. I, I totally agree, and and I and I think it's um it's important that those that those clear messages are uh, resonate, and and that action and that mode of action and leadership is highly visible. I was interested in what you were saying about um, showcasing success, and I think that's a critical aspect. I suppose I did have I had a little voice ringing in my head there from Eddie Harpersy Ramsden. Mm. Who, who said some time ago, you know, as Māori, we, we experience racism in our ordinary lives, but wait till you're successful mm. and then you'll really <laughs> experience an extraordinary level of racism. And so I, I just wonder about that. I think showcasing success is critical. Uh, and I wonder if you have any reflections about the level of racism that we all face when we have degrees of success. Yeah, look, um, first of all, um, Iti Hapiti Ramsden, wow, what a wahine toa. Um, I met her in the very early stages of my health career and um, from from the very first time that I met her, she just had this amazing uh, hua, this, this wairua that was beautiful. So I, I feel very privileged to have had spent some time with her. So thank you for mentioning her. She's definitely one of my my, my heroes. Yes, look, um, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? But um, one of the things that I love about showcasing Māori success in any, in any space is two things. Um, it actually reinforces the fact that we're experts in our own right. And often... Our mātauranga, and, and you, you would have experienced this, it's degraded, it's it's mythical, it's all this nonsense, you know, in terms of how it's classified. So show, showcasing success to me is one of our key strategies for um, mitigating and eliminating racism. But I take your point. Um, there's a couple of things that I would talk about in that respect. One is... There's a, a maturing of the conversation, I think, in Aotearoa that is happening right now, which is, and this is a reflection of that, the opportunity to have a kōrero around racism. And that's happening in between Māori and non-Māori um, and also, you know, generally in government circles, but also in communities. And part of that, and it's something that we need to talk about as um, tangata whenua, is what is our role to Manaki non-Māori champions? What is our role to Manaki non-Māori allies? And how does that play out? Because there are multiple views about that. And it's something that in a change environment that we're in, especially in the health system, I think we need to tackle and tackle in a mature and proactive way. On, if we think about it as a continuum, on one side it's, no, no, just get out of it. You're not Māori. <laughs> Stay away and um, just let us get on with it and, um, and and you just you just support it. Then on another, you know, on that continuum, there are other options and one is no mai, haere mai. Welcome to the movement. Welcome to the kaupapa. Um, and let's work together. And, and for me personally, I think it's a mix of those things. But the opportunity for us as, as Māori in this country and as um, tangata tiriti in this country is to, is to work out what that might look like and how we translate that into practice. But what I know is that um, there are more non-Māori clinicians than there are Māori clinicians and our people access more non-Māori services at the moment than they do kaupapa Māori. So at this stage in our journey, we need as many allies as we can get, in my humble opinion. Um, but those allies have to work with us with integrity, with humility, and understand that there is a there is something to do with the balancing of power 
as much as the shifting of the narrative in terms of how we express, explore, um, ensure that uh, te ao Māori and even our own interpretation of Western science, the way that we interpret it as tangata whenua, um, has an integral role to play to benefit Māori, but also all others in this country. And when we can start to have mature conversations about that and roll out the solutions that we agree on, which take us to the next level, I think we've, we're going to be doing something pretty special. Mm. Oh, without doubt. And, and I think that's a, that's an important sort of tension that we all live with and work with, isn't it? This, to what degree do we spend time and energy working with our Pākehā allies and, and continue to reflect on that because there, there is a, an easy default to actually draw us into that territory more and more, which, which means the opportunity cost of that, if you will, is we're actually not focusing on, um, you might say our, our bread and butter Māori issues. Uh, so how do you manage that stuff? Mm, you're right. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm an optimist, um, Hine, so, uh, and, People go, oh, glass half full. And I go, I say, no, no, glass full. <laughs> and sometimes the glass leaks quite significantly, especially when I've had experiences of racism. Um, I have to keep topping up that glass and being optimistic about our future because, one, I believe in the value of tangata whenua knowledge. I believe in it wholeheartedly. And I know that um, it can benefit not only us but but. Aotearoa as a whole, but also globally. I mean, our knowledge, our knowledge systems are incredible, absolutely incredible. And in many cases, I find others are catching up. A practical example would be the way that Māori have embraced whānau-centric, um, bringing in the whole person, not just the, the body part of the person. You know, that's actually the model that everyone should be following. We have embraced the kaupapa of well-being or oranga since we became into being uh, and now all of a sudden it's the you know model the model of choice or or, or the model that um you know people are aspiring to but actually it's the way we've lived it's just through processes of um colonization and things like that you know we've had to fight our way back um into into some of those spaces but inherently that's who we are and that really is the model that the whole health system should be aspiring to deliver, um, and Māori have shown the way in that area. Um, so, look, I've digressed because I keep talking about how fabulous we are, but um, we certainly have a lot to offer, Hine. We have so much to offer, and I would like to also encourage Aotearoa to change the narrative. So by changing the narrative, we actually free ourselves up, actually, to not just celebrate success, but to actually push that walker out for everyone. So changing the narrative to me is something that we actually have to do quite purposefully and drawing on your expertise around um, neuroplasticity and things like that, it is about creating a different way of us thinking and therefore expressing and speaking and acting in regard to the embedding of Mā Tauranga and Te Ao Māori as something special and unique to this country that is um, going to benefit all of us. But the tension, sorry, I'm going going a bit skew with here. The tension, look, sometimes it's it's a bit of a balancing act, um, often get called upon to support non-Māori who um, in their own way sort of feeling, I want to help but I don't know what to do and then I do something and then I get the slap because I do it wrong, <laughs> you know, the metaphorical and so it is a bit of a balancing act in terms of how much of you you give in different spaces. So it's not an easy question to answer. But I'll tell you what I do know is that fake equity issue, which I talked about before, I am testing whether when non-Māori come, whether or not they're in that space because um, we can't afford to be wasting our energy on people who are fake equity, basically. So what I do now is I do test the integrity of people when they come to ask for support. Mm. How do you test it? I ask them. <laughs> I put out the widow. Uh -huh. mm. And so mm. how do you assess to what extent they 
they really do walk the talk. Yes. So, so, so I put out the widow and I say, you've come to me, you know, you're looking for support, you're looking for Afi. Um, and I talk about fake equity and then we have a conversation and, um, it becomes really clear really quickly, uh, that this is either an opportunity to position themselves so they can, um, in some cases, access funding. In other cases, they come across as, as very legitimate. Um, you, you can, you can feel it too, Henny. You can feel, uh, when they're talking to you, whether or not they're legitimate or not. And I've had several recent experiences. And in some cases, I have declined to work with organizations or people at this stage and ask them to just go back and explore and maybe build their own understanding off their own bat, which is a showing of commitment. Um, as well, yes, but I'm a bit more in your face about it now compared to when I was younger. I think maybe I'm getting older and grumpier. <laughs> well, I think we all um, grow in our sense of ability to communicate with clarity those particular issues, and and so it's really it's really important for us to hear that that that's what you're doing and how you're testing people's integrity. Mm. Uh, around this issue of fake equity and what other people's agendas are, because I think sometimes too people may not have thought through their own agendas and the complexity of those issues. So that's that's useful. Um, I was also really interested by your quarter around changing the narrative. Mm. Are there some specific examples that you could share around how people can think about their existing narrative and identify what the, what that actually is and how it influences what they do. It might, how it be, how it influences their racist thinking or behavior. And, and what are the kinds of things that people can do to shift their own narrative or the narrative of the, of the organization they work in? If I just go back to the, to the concept of changing the narrative, um, some people think it's a communications campaign, but that's not changing the narrative. That might be a channel that you use to influence how people think or see things. Um, but changing the narrative is, is more fundamental about how we can reposition how people think, see, feel, hear issues around, for example, the value of tangata whenua in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and globally. And again, comms is a channel, but it's not a communication campaign. And I go back to the fundamentals around, um, you know, if people understand and commit, that's the first step to change. So part of that is, you know, you could have a suite of education, you could have a suite of literacy. Um, and the work that I've done recently, especially over the last two years, being asked to speak at different things, um, I've actually gone back to look at um, historical examples right back to you know the early uh, mid to mid to late 1800s and used the media actually as a good example um, radio newspapers stuff like that but right back to the 1840s to show how this narrative has been created around Maori as dependent um, not able to make the best choices um, and I've had a, I've got a series of snippets of examples and it's actually, it's confronting for a lot of the people, Māori and non-Māori, because when you see the history of it and the compounding cumulative disadvantage that it has placed us in, you realise how surreptitiously but also in an overt space when you look at it together as a package how one part of society, media, for example, um, non-Māori media, has created this narrative which many of us have just fallen into because it's, um, it, it's, it's propositioned as, as truth. I suppose I'm getting into the fake news cordial, but we won't go there. <laughs> but to see the story unfold over time and how unfair and unjust and, quite frankly, um, the most overt display of racism over many decades is quite shocking to people when you convey it that way. But it is fact. 
it is real and it's created this mindset amongst New Zealanders and a perception which is about who we are and you know what we stand for and what we do which is just a nonsense it's an absolute nonsense so showcasing success is part of tackling um, changing the narrative as well as is all, all the other different things that we do mm. it's it's incredibly potent isn't it going back to, through history, through uh, recognizing events and how they're documented and the quarter of the day and actually seeing that cumulative, mm. insidious uh, building up of um, a story about who we are as Māori and who who the colonizers are. And so I wonder if you could talk to the narrative of the Māori Health Authority and 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 how you're constructing that story. And I'm interested about the number of Māori women and leadership roles around that and how that helps all of you to move this to move this new way of thinking, this new narrative forward. Yes, it, it, it is interesting how there is a lot of wahine leadership um, across the motu. And can I just acknowledge our tāne Māori as well because... <laughs> Just so happens there's Wahine, um, so my co-chair, Tipa Mahuta, of course, myself, and then you've got Rihanna and Margie. Um, and Rob, Rob won't mind me saying this, but Rob's the token male <laughs> as chair of HNZ. He's going to kill me when he hears this. No, way, he's all good. Um, so, look, our narrative, our narr- we're building our narrative, but we're very clear that um, from a tangata whenua perspective, from an Indigenous perspective, um, you know, we are innovative, we are change agents, we have expertise that hasn't been fully utilised, valued, deployed, operationalised in the New Zealand health system. And inherent within that is so much promise and so much practical um, opportunities for solutions uh, to be commissioned, to be funded, to be delivered. Uh, you know, it's a very, very exciting place to be in. We are a very constructive organisation. We value our partners, Māori and non-Māori, and we want to celebrate and showcase success, not just for and with and by um and led by our own people. But again, as I say, you know, this is a a very important moment in New Zealand's history in terms of how we once again contribute to the well-being of Aotearoa in New Zealand. And I say once again because again we go back to when we came here, how innovative we were, how entrepreneurial we were. We were the backbone of supporting New Zealand's economy. Um, we were traders. We were, you know, we were, we were all over the world looking for opportunities, and those opportunities were taken from us through legislation, through ill health, through, um, you know, when when our land was, was taken away. So we're recovering from all of that in this post, you know, colonization world, and. I often have to remind people that post-colonisation trauma is a thing, even if some people don't actually experience it themselves. It is the manifestation of that is, you know, inequity as it currently stands. But um, I am super excited about our future. Uh, will MHA get it right all the time? No, not all the time. We'll make some mistakes along the way. But... Um, People, uh, Aotea- people of Aotearoa and our own people can have confidence that we will uh, move every ob- try and move every obstacle we can to support um, Māori health and well-being, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but for the future of our mokopuna. Mm-hmm. I'm interested that you say post-colonisation. Do you really think that colonisation is over? And, and I'm interested in what your evidence is for that, especially in the context of COVID. Um, that's a very good point. Yes. And, and when I use the term post-colonization, I do mean, um, 
from a period of time. So when when this when the settlers <laughs> came over, like from that day, so to speak. And there certainly are examples of how monocultural thinking has created several barriers um, for us right now. And if we don't do something about it, they certainly will continue to impede progress moving forward. So I take your point. I think it is a very good one. You know, it's a complex time and we've got so many opportunities and and having you and this ropu of, of wahine toa really, really spearheading the way forward is is exciting. Do you think there are some specific features of leadership that wahine bring forward that are um that are particularly effective around combating racism because mm. we're all different aren't we we're all we all have different strengths and things like that so that's the first thing i do think we are negotiators i do think we have particular skills around um seeing both sides and because we we we're negotiating life, we're negotiating being mothers, we're negotiating being professionals, you know, all those types of things, um, on the marae, off the marae, things like that. So I think we're very good negotiators. Um, we have a natural tendency to manaki. I'm not saying that men don't, but as our, our nurturing side, you know, um, whether or not we have children or not, I think we are um, great nurturers and as um, Te Whare Tangata, you know, we have uh, an opportunity to to really, you know, imbue that sense of um, giving life and bringing life to the fore and maintaining and nurturing. And again, I'm not saying our Māori Tāne don't do that as well, but I think that's a, a unique feature of, um, of Wahine Māori. I also think that... <laughs> When we need to be, we can be quite uh, forceful. I, I think we're actually really good at drawing, not barriers, but there's a line. We know where our line is. We can be quite combative. <laughs> but For sure. We also <laughs> but we also have this, I, I feel, innate sen- sense of empathy and compassion. And I think we're pretty good at at trying to find what's the mix of those, what's the optimal mix of those in different s- scenarios. The other thing I think we're excellent at is multitasking um, and sometimes to our detriment. And I often talk to my friends about, you know, a little bit of self-compassion um, is not selfish. It's actually an opportunity for us to top up our well-being bank, our resilience accounts, so we can um, do more of the stuff that we love for others uh, who we love the most. So, yeah, I, th- I do think we have certain traits, but, you know, I also um, shout out to our, our, our Māori males as well. Kawhai. So just thinking about the future, do you have a sense in your mind of the timing of where we might see an Aotearoa that's racism-free? Is Is that even a potential reality? And, and what part might might you play in that? Yeah, what a great question. Um, so I would, I'm would, i always going to say yes. <laughs> that is an opportunity, is a reality. I'll tell you what I have noticed is with our younger ones coming through um, and how, how, how much more lateral thinking they are about a whole variety of things, um, I think our future is um is is looking more and more promising in the um anti-racism anti-bias anti-discrimination space they our young ones always amaze me about not just their um technical skills and all of their you know uh uh uh, all of the applications uh, often my son says oh mum there's an app for that and i go oh is there (laughs) go and find it um their sense of social justice actually is um, is really impressive, and their care for Titaio as a natural part of their being it just that's really impressive to me. And with the recent release of the um, education, updating the education curriculum, 
regarding you know our history, Aotearoa history. And I haven't seen the detail, but I'm I'm hoping it's it's more in, in line in terms of where you and I <laughs> would want it to go. I think that's a huge part of a changing the narrative, but um, b also creating a space for us to think and feel and hear things that are different around what we've heard historically regarding the valuing of Māori as Indigenous versus um, all of the other nonsense that has come out historically. So I am ever hopeful, and yeah, I am ever hopeful and optimistic because I hope that in some small way, myself and many others, including yourself, uh, can support can be really great to Puna basically and support a better a better world for our Mukapuna. Mm. Oh Kia ora. Um, <laughs> it's been it's been a really invigorating conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your your experiences and your your wisdom. Um, I, I have no doubt that this will be very thought provoking for our listeners. Um, and, and our viewers, thank you for making the time, Sharon. Namihi, kia kia. Namihi, thank you.